Maybe we'll have them back by Friday. Possibly. Not a promise. Could happen. But there will be, this is a promise, a review session for the final in this room after the lecture on Friday. Um, a good time to come with questions. What's, uh, um, they'll probably go through chapter by chapter and sort of say, you know, what, what's, uh, what are the complicated issues in each chapter, the issues that weren't discussed in class? The final itself will be in this room one week from Friday. So it's not during finals week. So if you're going to come, don't come in finals week because the final will be over by finals week. And then a week from today, at the end of lecture, course evaluations will be distributed. So if you're watching this at home and you uh, would like to criticize or comment or in some way uh, evaluate this course, well, come in on Wednesday, at least at the end, so that you can fill out the forms. All right, so where are we? We've been talking this whole quarter about relationships, about how relationships, intimate relationships, succeed or fail. Interesting topic. And we've talked about a lot of the things that sort of make relationships successful, a lot of things that couples do to make relationships successful, and a lot of things that put relationships at risk, a lot of things that make relationships not so good. What we haven't talked about is, especially in the case of relationships that are not so good, well, what can we do about it? So let's say there's a relationship that you want to help or improve or make better. Is there anything that you can do to make relationships better? Can we change relationships? Now, we've talked about a lot of ways that we, as members of our own relationships, can improve our relationships. But we haven't talked about what can we do for other people's relationships? How can we intervene as concerned citizens, as therapists, as policymakers? Well, that's the issue we're going to talk about today. Now, what we're going to, this topic is a big enough topic that people get degrees just in this topic. And I'm going to spend one lecture on it. So I'm going to zoom through a lot of stuff. I'm going to try to give you an overview of the field as I see it. But I'm acknowledging at the outset that this is a shallow treatment of a deep and complex issue. That issue being, how can we improve relationships and make them better? Well, first of all, what's the issue? What are we trying to actually accomplish? We're trying to address the phenomenon that in the United States, people, when they experience relationship problems, go for help. Not all of them, but it's the number one reason why people seek counseling in the United States. So of all the people who seek counseling or therapy in the entire United States, the number one thing that sends them there isn't I'm having arguments with my mom. It isn't, I'm having difficulties at work. I mean, the people do go to therapy for those issues, but the number one reason is, I'm having trouble in my relationship. That is what sends people to therapy. So it, what, what the topic for today is, well, what is it that a counselor can do? What, what can we offer people who are seeking counseling for their relationship problems? Because there are a lot of them. Here's the problem. By the time couples seek counseling, their problems are usually severe and old, which is to say, by the time people seek counseling for intimate relationship problems, those problems have already become major problems and have been problems for a while. So research, when people come to therapy, they ask them, how long is this problem that you're coming to therapy for? How long has it been a problem? And studies that have asked that question find that the answer is, a long time. Years, in fact. Most people in their very first therapy session will confess that, oh, this problem that we're trying to get the help on has been a problem for years. Which raises a question. Why are these problems so severe? Why is it that our relationships have the power to hurt us so deeply? I was talking to a therapist. I have a lot of friends who are therapists. Although I am not one. But Tom Bradbury got his degree in clinical, psych clinical psychology. My degree is in social psychology, so I never studied therapy. But <clears throat> a therapist that I know talks about couples therapy that he does, and he talked about one couple that came to therapy for terrible problems and the big issue that they fought about, the big issue that they argued about was whether you should clean the lint screen on the clothes dryer before you put the clothes in or at the end of the load after you take the clothes out? I wasn't asking for votes. 
Why not do it both? But that's not the point. The point is that why was this such a severe problem? Why, why is it that a couple, I mean, you, you were laughing. Like, oh, come on, who cares? And yet you might imagine the problems that you fight about in your own relationship might, to an outside observer, seem quite trivial also. Why do people in relationships have the power to make each other crazy? When from an outsider, like, oh, come on, can't you just sort of resolve that? Why is that such a big deal? And the answer to this question, it's kind of a profound one, is that the people we're in intimate relationships with, we let in deeper than anyone else. So what happens between us and those people also cuts deeper than anyone else. And to, as an analogy, let me, let me think, of, think of this. If I have a tiny little pin, a tiny little pin, and I'm up here and you're there in the audience and I jab at you, how much does it hurt? Not at all. I'm not going to get much damage with that little pin. Okay, now if, what if I'm standing up close to you and I poke, poke the tip of your skin with it? Little pin, poke, poke your skin with it. Little pin. Not going to do much damage either. I might, you might feel it. Like, okay, stop, stop, quit it. But it's, it's still not much damage. Now, imagine that I break open your chest and shove that pin into your heart. <laughs> it's the same little pin. But when we're talking to our relationship partners, our hearts are open. Our chests are open, and there's our heart beating. We're close to these intimate partners in a way that we're not to almost anyone else that we talk to. So what we do, what do we do to our partners and what they do to us has the power to touch us deeply, to hurt us deeply. And the wounds of those kind of, th those are deep, deep wounds. So that's why relationship problems are so intense, because we're so involved with our relationship partners in a way that we aren't with anybody else. If you and I disagree about the lint screen, I don't care. But if I disagree with my partner, that be can become a big issue because we're so involved in each other's lives. So if that's true, why do we wait so long before getting help? Well, why do you think? Why do people wait until problems are so old and have been lasted for years before going to get counseling? Yes, Maya. That's why they go to help. The que and I think the point is, Maya, that it takes people a long time to realize that. And the, uh, the anal what's your name? Riley. Riley? Um, it's like, really true. Think about what we talked about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago we were talking about cognitive patterns. I'm going I'm to move, I have a lot of, I appreciate the, the hands a lot. I'll, there'll be other opportunities to contribute. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't call on anyone, everyone. But Riley's point is, people wait before getting help because when you get help, you're acknowledging there's a problem. And until you get help, you can do a lot of the stuff we were talking about in this class a couple weeks ago. Now remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about all the ways you can sort of say, oh, that problem, it's not important. Oh, that problem, I'm going to ignore it. I'm not going to pay attention to it. Well, there's a lot of evidence that people do that. The problem is, the problem doesn't disappear. And maybe it doesn't get any worse, but if it does get worse, and people are doing what we talked about, sort of ignoring it, not paying attention to it, thinking it's not important, well, some problems in, in that kind of absence of attention will get worse and worse and worse. We talked, too, a couple weeks ago that we're highly motivated to believe good things about our relationships. We don't want to believe we're in a bad relationship. That'd be very painful. Again, the downside of that motive is... We can wait too long before getting help. And as Riley points out, once you get help, you're acknowledging something that is essentially very painful to acknowledge. There's another point here, which is that usually our relationship problems don't happen like a gunshot. Bang! Oh, a relationship problem. Rather, relationship problems are like the old story of the frog in the pot of water. You know the story? That basically there's a frog in a pot of cold water, and then you put the water on the stove, and it slowly gets hot. Now, the frog could easily jump out of the pot of water, but it, it, there's never a moment where the water's too hot. It just gets a little bit hotter, 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 and then the frog ends up boiling to death before it, it, without jumping out. In a way, our relationships are like that. Our problems fester. 
relationship problems tend to change slowly. So it's easy at the beginning to say, well, that's not an important problem. It really isn't an important problem. And then every day it gets a little worse, but it's just a tiny bit worse. There's never a clear threshold for, oh, here's where we've got to go for help. Until it, sometimes there's a triggering event, an infidelity, uh, uh, an outbreak of violence, a period of separation, where suddenly the couple says, okay, now we can't deny anymore, we need help. But that's what it takes to overcome the motive not to see the problem. So it, it's reasonable, it's human, and it's consistent with everything in this course that relationship problems, when they happen, are serious, and by the time people go for help, those problems have been around for a while. Well, what can we do about it? What can we do to help couples? In general, people who try to help other people, like people who are trained in public health, distinguish between three different ways of helping, three different strategies for helping people's lives. And the strategy that is sort of most common that you think about is called tertiary prevention. Tertiary prevention is treat the disease. Find the diseased people and cure them. So tertiary pre prevention is, oh, you've got swine flu? Let's give you fluids and take care of you. You've got the disease, now we're helping you. Couples therapy, as you and I might imagine it, where the couple says, we're in terrible shape, therapists help us. That's tertiary prevention. They've got the disease, the disease being an unhappy relationship. Tertiary prevention says, how can we fix that disease? How can we fix the relationship? But public health people say, that's not our only option. We don't have to necessarily wait until people get the disease. So there's two other kinds of prevention. Secondary prevention, which is help those at risk. Find people who you think are likely to get the disease and try to intervene before they actually get the disease. So um, in this case, in the case of relationships, secondary prevention would be things like Here's a special class for children of alcoholics. Because we know that children of alcoholics are highly at risk for relationship problems in their own adult lives. Secondary prevention would be, if your parents divorced, you better take this class before you get married yourself. Because we know that you're at risk. So secondary prevention is, is trying to keep people from getting the disease. As opposed to tertiary prevention where we're trying to cure people with the disease. Primary prevention says, forget risk, let's just give something to everybody to make sure nobody ever comes close to this disease. Primary prevention, uh, prevent the disease from happening. An example in the real world, uh, an example in the physical world of primary prevention is vaccinations. So everyone, a lot of people in the, in the, in the country get vaccinated, whether they're at risk or not. The government just says, you know what, everyone's going to get the measles vaccination. Relationship researchers have in recent years try to say, can we somehow vaccinate people against divorce or bad relationships? Can we give people some kind of treatment before they're ever in a, at risk at all that'll help them? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. So three levels of intervention, tertiary, secondary, primary. Very important to know this. And it's important to know that what most people do is wait until they have the disease and then try to get fixed. And that's tertiary prevention. That's couples therapy. So, what, is, what happens in couples therapy? What brings people specifically to couples therapy? Let's first talk about what couples therapy is. Generally, here's how couples therapy works. It's typically one therapist and the couple. Some therapists will say, okay, you know, I'll meet with each person separately, but I also want to see the two people together. But your typical, again, if you've ever seen a movie, where couples therapy happens, or a, a comedy sketch where couples therapy happens. I mean, there's a cultural image of what this is like. There's a therapist, and there's two chairs in front of the therapist, and the two chairs have a couple in them, and they're talking, and they're arguing, and the therapist's like, hey, hey, hey. But you can imagine 15, 15 to 20 weekly sessions, 60 to 90 minutes long. The truth is that therapists who do couples therapy have a variety of backgrounds. If you're interested in becoming a couples therapist, I mean, you're in luck because it's not hard to do. Well, I mean, maybe it's hard to do, I'm not one. But you can do it with a, a PhD, you can do it with a PsyD, 
You can do it with a master's in family counseling. You can do it in a master's of social work, clinical social work. There's tons of different degrees that allow you to put up a shingle and call yourself a couples therapist. There are certain times when couples therapy is what they call contraindicated. In other words, you don't want to give couples therapy to particular couples. Particularly couples that have other, where, the, where you have, as a therapist, a sense that, you know what? This couple needs other kinds of therapy, not couples therapy. For example, if they're struggling with a serious drug addiction, they need drug addiction counseling, and the couple's issues are secondary. If they're dealing with serious domestic violence, they need to deal with that issue. They're not gonna, we don't need to have them talk about um, their emotional communication. Often there's specific therapies for people dealing with infidelity. Another, another therapist that I know of says, calls couples therapy divorce therapy. He says, really, all I'm doing is getting them used to the idea that they're going to get divorced. Or at least he says, in his experience, that's what he's found himself doing. But generally, that's the idea. A couple goes to a therapist and says, help. We, I mean, what are the, what's the message? What's the couple saying to the therapist? The couple's, the couple's saying, we're committed to, to this relationship. We want this relationship to work, but it isn't working. We're very unhappy. Help us. Help us get where we want to go. It's really poignant, if you think about it, and kind of tragic that so many couples say, I want this to be good. And the partner in the other chair says, I want this to be good. And yet we feel incapable of making it good. We both want the same thing, but we can't get there. Help. Help. Well, when they come to therapy, what are they complaining about? Uh, any animations this whole course have been borrowed from Tom Bradbury. <laughs> well, uh, research on this topic asked therapists to basically report what are the complaints that the couples come to you with. And you can see the top three, communication, power struggles, unrealistic expectations. In the ones in bold, which are those three plus lack of loving feelings and serious personal issues, that affect the relationship are the ones that therapists themselves rate as the hardest to treat. So what you can see is the most common problems are also the ones that therapists think, therapists think, are the hardest to treat. And you can easily imagine. Couples commit, what does it mean, unrealistic expectations? It's when each person is accusing the other of, and saying, hey, you're expecting too much. What you're asking of me isn't fair. You're asking something that I cannot give you, and it's unfair for you to ask. Well, that's tough. Because a person says, this is what I want. And the other person is saying, not only are you not going to get what you want, but you don't have any right to want what you want. Oh, that's tough, because this is what I want. I still want this. What are you going to do? What can you do as a therapist? That's a very tough issue. So the problems that people are coming up with are tough, tough problems. Let's go through, let's describe a typical case in really an abstract form, okay? A rarely abstract, but this is just the outline of, give you a flavor of how incredibly <clears throat> tangled these cases can be. Just a typical one. You get a, a, a man and a woman, relationship between a man and a woman, Jack and Jill here. Jill says, I'm not getting enough closeness from Jack. I also want him to do more at home and spend more time with the kids. Very frequent, common complaint, especially from, let's say, wives and married couples. She's saying, my husband is he's, he's aloof. He's not involved in, with the family. He doesn't care about me. I don't feel like he is emotionally present. I want him to sort of step up a little bit, to care more about what's going on in the family, and I don't feel like he does. He just comes home, and he, he's distant. And Jack... The husband says, oh, we've got plenty of closeness, but where's our sex life? I, you want closeness? Let's have some sex. We'll be very close after that. I, need, I also need a little bit of my own space. I work very, very hard, and I want to be valued for what I do. I'm putting a roof over our heads. I'm paying the bills, and, now I'm, and I come home, and I'm working, working, working. I come home, and then you're like, oh, you aren't doing enough. That doesn't seem fair. So you see, they have totally different perspectives on the relationship. 
They both want something from the other person, and each one is saying, hey, you step up and I'll step up. So Jill says to Jack, you are insensitive and you're selfish. It's all about you, you, you. I don't feel sexually attracted to you when you're insensitive and selfish. And he says, hey, you're cold and you're a nag. I don't feel like I want to hear about your day when you're being a nag and being cold to me. I don't feel close to you when you're withholding sex. So both of them, I mean, this is not, this is not something like, oh, I've never heard of a couple like this. This is like your typical couple from every movie and every sitcom. And yet, in real life, this is a difficult situation. And both people feel misunderstood. And both people feel powerless to improve the situation because both people are saying, what I want is fair to want. And your failure to give me what I want is unfair. And therefore, I must say, malicious. You want to improve the relationship? Give me what I want. But they're both saying that. They say, I'll give you what you want if you give me what I want. They both feel unloved. They both feel unappreciated. He says, I'm working, 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 and I come home, and you're, on, you're mad at me when I walk in the door. She says, I'm working, 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 and then you come home finally to give me some relief, and then you don't want to be involved? And you, don't, you think I've been having a vacation at home, taking care of the family? And they both feel pessimistic about the future of the relationship. How can, if, if, I don't, if I can't make this better, and right now this sucks, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? We have the same arguments over and over. Both are willing to invest in the relationship. You imagine a couple like this, they have a house, they have kids, and more than that, they have a history. Couples that have been together for a while have a history. You don't want to let go of your history. You've got photo albums. You've got shared CDs. You have children and a home and family and a friendship network. They have a lot invested in this relationship, even though their intimacy is broken. They want something that will work. They go to the therapist and they say, help, help. We've been wounding each other. We've been fighting with each other. We haven't shared intimacy. We haven't shared affection. Do something for us. Get us out of this. OK, what do we have to offer them? What do we have to offer them? Couples therapy is not old. <clears throat> you know, figure it, individual therapy is not that old, right? Freud is just a little bit over a century old. Couples therapy didn't really start until divorce became kind of more accepted. So couples therapy is really a product of like the 60s. That's when couples therapy became a bigger deal in the 70s. It was a huge deal. So we're talking about something that's less than 50 years old. And yet in that time, a number of different schools of thought have emerged on what we can do. A number of different schools of thought. So most therapists don't necessarily rigidly adhere to one type of therapy. But there are specific types that have been described in different books, different systems of thought, different kinds of training. There are more different kinds of couples therapy than I can possibly review in this one lecture. What I will do, though, is I'd like to review for you uh, three of them and just give you a sense of how different they are. Now, again, most therapists aren't necessarily deeply in one school of thought. Most therapists would call themselves maybe eclectic. They'll do whatever seems right in the moment. But it's worth knowing what these kind of couples therapy archetypes feel like, what the flavors of them are. So there you are. You're a therapist. There's Jack and Jill. They're saying, well, you know, what are we going to do about this problem? What do you do? Well, it depends what model you're working with. Let's imagine you're working with a psychodynamic model. That's one flavor of therapy. Psychodynamic models say, they come out of Freudian therapy, Freudian individual therapy. They say, look, people are driven by unconscious motivations that were developed in their infancy. They're playing out in their adult relationships, all sorts of unresolved issues from their infant relationships with their parents, often. So the goal of psychodynamic therapy is to identify and change these unconscious perceptions of the partner and the associated emotional reactions. Typically, a psychodynamic model says, you're not mad at your wife, you're mad at your mom. And you're projecting your issues with your mom onto your wife. And of course, Freud turns around and says, and you're not mad at your husband, you're mad at your dad. You're trying to get from your husband what you didn't get from your dad. So 
so the, now the psychodynamic therapist doesn't come right out and say that, but rather it comes out and says, well, let's, let's find out who you, who you are. The, and, and, the, and if I can do that, if I can figure out what your individual issues are, then I can try to promote sort of more real responses to the situation. So the psychodynamic therapist says, don't respond to your childhood trauma. Respond to each other in the moment. They'll try to not be playing out with each other these old dynamics. So for, now that's just the model. There's a number of different specific types of therapy that are associated with this model. And here's one example. Insight-oriented couple therapy, I-O-C-T, they call it. And insight-oriented couple therapy says this. Let's talk about who these two people are as individuals. Let's talk about who these two people are in terms of their personal histories. With the idea being that if Jack really understands Jill, if he thinks about how, you know, Jill, her parents did break up. She was raised by her mom. Her whole life she saw models of distant, absent dads. Well, of course she's sensitive to my distance. I can't get too mad at her if I have insight into her. If I understand where her issues come from, I can't be that mad. In the same way, Jill will be understanding Jack. It's like, oh, now we've been talking in therapy about how Jack, you know, had an overprotective mom, and he always had to try to define himself by rebelling against her, and now he's trying to rebel against me. I get it. The idea being that if you have insight, you can't be that mad. So a psychodynamic model, it's all about insight. It's all about the individual saying, who are these people? Let's help the couple to figure each other out. If we can do that, maybe they won't be as mad at each other. So you can imagine the kind of conversations that a, psycho a psychodynamic therapist are going to have with Jack and Jill here. They're going to be talking about their childhoods a lot. They're going to be saying, so you know, what do you expect and why do you expect what you expect in your relationships? That's one approach. But it's not the only approach. And the, a big contrast in the field of couples therapy is between these psychodynamic models and behavioral models. Behavioral models are all about the present. I don't care about your history. I don't want to know about your dreams. I don't want to know about your parents. Your parents aren't here. This isn't a relationship with your parents. This is a relationship between you, Jack, and you, Jill. Let's talk about what you guys do in the moment. Just like the behavior, you know, obviously this is related to the behavioral models of marriage that we've been talking about, or, or relationships that we've been talking about. The goal of behavioral models of therapy is change the behaviors and the cognitions that give rise to them. Promote basic communication skills. That's the idea. Behavioral models say, you guys don't know how to talk to each other, so I'm going to teach you how to talk to each other. And the classic example is called traditional behavioral couples therapy, TBCT. Traditional behavioral couples therapy is all about homework. It's about rules, setting rules. Say, okay, couple, Jack, Jill, between now and next week, I want you to do this homework. And some of the homework will be practice listening to each other and summarizing what the other person says. Okay? So you're, talk, you're really good at talking, hearing yourselves talk. You're not so good at listening, so let's practice. What you'll be each doing, and you'll take turns. First Jill will do it first, and then Jack, and the next night Jack will do it first, then Jill. At the end of each day, I want you to say, all right, Jack, here's what I'm feeling about our relationship today. And Jack, here's your task, buddy. Shut up. Don't you say nothing. Don't you say anything. For, and let her talk for as long as she wants to. Don't interrupt. Try that. Yeah, but, but, you know, what if she starts saying something ridiculous? No! Don't say a thing! And in fact, some therapy um, has, in fact, uh, uh, one program will give couples a piece of floor tile, a piece of actual tile, and they'll say, if you're holding the tile, then you have the floor. Get it? <laughs> if you have the floor, no one else can speak. So, I've got the floor. I'm going to speak until as long as I'm holding this, I speak. You cannot speak. And I'm talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. <sighs> I'm done. Now you have the floor. But your job when you get the floor is to summarize what the other person said. I hear you, honey. You're saying, and I, you know, do, do I hear you? Under, do I understand you correctly? Am I hearing you? No, you are not. Okay, let me try again. I'm going to keep trying. Traditional behavioral couples therapy gives couples homework. 
teaches them skills, listening skills, communication skills. Try saying your feelings without making an accusation. That's your homework. So use statements like this. <clears throat> I feel that you don't care about me. Is that a feeling? That's not a feeling. That is a belief, isn't it? You believe that I don't care about you. Well, what are you feeling? Tell me what you feel. If you say, I feel, what, give me a feeling. Well, I, I feel rejected. Yes, now that's a feeling. You've just expressed a real feeling. Now you're vulnerable. The belief was an accusation. Don't say, I feel, when you mean I believe. And I don't want to know what you believe. I want to know what you feel. That's how a behavioral couples therapist talks. It's about in the moment. It's not about insight. It's about doing things differently, doing them better. Now, traditional behavioral couples therapy focused on communication really, really solidly. In, uh, in the mid to late 80s, it, was, it evolved into a cognitive behavioral couples therapy where they weren't just talking about behavior, they were also talking about thoughts like attributions. So for example, the homework in CBCT, co co Cognitive Behavioral Couples Therapy, would be something like, list five things that your partner is struggling with that might make it hard for your partner to be there for you. In other words, training yourself in making adaptive attributions. Training yourself in the skill of paying attention to stress. But it's all about skills and training. It's about saying, you're doing it wrong. There's a right way. Let me teach you how to do it right. That's what behavioral therapy does. Question, Danielle. So, back to the model, yes. Danielle says, so in psychodynamic, are they actually changing anything? Well, the, the, the idea, the assumption of psychodynamic models is if you get insight, change will come naturally. If I understand you, the relationship will change. Behavioral therapy says, no, that's not true. But if I change what I do, the relationship will change. If I just squeeze people into shape. So a behavioral therapist will say, this sounds contrived. I know it does, but it works. You go to the gym. What are you doing at the gym? You're doing this with lift. You're lifting weights. Is that a natural thing to do? Is that something people do in nature? Is it, what about that machine where you're on your back and you're doing this? I mean, nobody does that in nature. But you're doing it at the gym. Why? Because it works. Because it makes you physically healthier. Well, do this. These exercises are also contrived. Yes, of course they're unnatural. Do it anyway, because it works. That's what they say. And that's not our only option. Oh, yes, Sarah. Sarah makes an excellent point. She says, well, <clears throat> one part of psychodynamic models would be to change the attributions I make for my partner's behavior, Sarah says. Because if I understand you know, why you're doing what you're doing, I'm less likely to sort of attribute your behavior to you don't like me, and I'm more likely to attribute to your childhood trauma. Yes, that's true. But the language is very different. And they don't explicitly focus on that attribution process. The focus is understand your partner. And then the idea is that then in the moment, I'm going to be less likely to make maladaptive attributions. Whereas in behavioral models, that's the focus, especially in cognitive behavioral models. I'm actually saying, think about making different attributions right now. It's much more targeted. So those are two possible models. Here's a third, emotion models. Emotion models say, look, relationships are unique. What makes relationships unique? is our emotional vulnerability in relationships. And what makes them so painful is that when we're vulnerable, we can be hurt. When I share, the most painful thing in the world, according to these models, is when I say, you've hurt me, and you say, tough, or I don't care, 
or when I say, I'm in pain and you don't soothe me or you don't touch me. That's the worst thing. So emotion models say, let's talk about our feelings, our core feelings, and how we can promote healthy responses to these things. Now, as Sarah, you might be saying, well, that's also kind of overlapping. Yes, there's overlap everywhere. The phenomenon is still relationships and intimacy, but it's a different spin. Here, it's not about behavior, it's not about communication, it's about what were you feeling? What are you feeling now? How does it make you feel when he does what he does, when she does what she does? How do you hope to feel? And how can you share that feeling with each other in a way that's safe? How can you soothe each other's emotions? How can you soothe each other's pain? And how can you be receptive to each other's pain? So the idea is to help couples to see that the relationship is a safe place. In other words, to make the relationship a safe place to express deep feelings. So this is a very different idea. You can see how it would be related to psychodynamic models. That you know, if, you, if the relationship was a safe place to express deep feelings, you might get more insight into your partner, sure. But the focus here is not on insight, it's on, it's still a process, but it's not so much a process of be specific behavior and following rules, but rather a process of getting closer by allowing share, the sharing of deep emotions. That's the, that's the goal here, is to make it, so there's, there's, there's two, two examples. Emotionally focused couples therapy simply says, emotionally focused couples therapy is specific to attachment theory, sort of derived from attachment theory. It says, the worst thing you can do in a relationship is say, I'm not there for you. Because that's the, that's the anti-attachment. What I want from, attachment theory says, what I want from my intimate relationships is a secure base is to know that if I turn around and I look back, you'll still be there. An attachment injury is when you, I, you've given me reason to doubt that. I don't know if I can count on you. Emotion-focused couple therapy says, let's, in this room, learn how to share, at least in this room, and then hopefully when you're alone, share what you're really feeling. Share what you're most afraid to share. And practice accepting that. It's, it's a little bit like behaviorally oriented therapy, but it's not about behavior. It's not about the words you use. It's about the emotions you share. The, with the idea being that if we can create a situation where couples are able to say, this is what I'm really about, this is what I'm really feeling, I'm terrified. Terrified that you will leave me. I'm terrified that you don't love me. I'm terrified that you don't really need me around. The ability to share those absolutely fundamental feelings and anxieties and be nurtured for it and be responded to in a positive way, that's what emotion focused therapy is all about creating in a couple, in a couple that's lost it. Heidi. Yes. Of course. Heidi's question is, well, how do you get to the deep feelings without sort of some kind of behavioral training and some kind of insight-oriented therapy? Well, I completely agree, of course. And I started at the outset by saying most therapists will use bits of these different models at different times. But a, a pure emotionally focused couples therapy would say, let's go from feelings to deeper and deeper and deeper feelings. And the focus will be on emotions. But yes, again, my point is not to say that these are, these are different continents, it, but they're different sort of spins on a common, common goal, which is helping couples. Robbie? Um, you also say about context. <coughs> there is no common statement. Uh, in the emotion model, the book uh, differentiates between primary emotional data and secondary emotional data. Yes. Yes, I'm, I keep saying it, yes. There, there is overlap, but absolutely, Robbie, is that behavioral models will also talk about emotions, 
And how, but the, the focus, again, it's subtle, but the focus of a behavioral model will be what's the best language to share emotions? And what's the best language to share a complaint? And what's the best language to share uh, a happy thought? And what's the best language to share anything that you say to your partner? Emotion-focused models are more narrow. They're not talking about language, but they're talking about emotions. There will be overlap. A pure behavioral third person will not ignore emotion. A pure emotion-focused person won't ignore behavior. It's just a shift in emphasis. Another example I want to talk to you about in terms of emotional focus therapy is a new kind of therapy called integrative behavioral couples therapy. And this is kind of a hybrid of emotion models and behavioral models developed by a guy at UCLA named Andrew Christensen. And the idea here would be to say, how can I understand my partner? It's kind of a, a mixture of all three of them. How can I understand my partner, learn how to share emotions with my partner, and also accept my partner and be accept and feel accepted by my partner. Integrative behavioral couples therapy, one of the focuses is, what are the, what are the, um, the catchphrase of integrative behavioral couples therapy that I kind of love is this. We do not get a line item veto on our partners. We don't get a line item veto on our partner. What that means is, you don't get to say about your partner, Oh, I love this about you, and this about you, this about you, but change that. No, your partner's a package. And integrative behavioral couples therapy, IBCT, tries to get you to understand, well, how is my partner a package? And what parts might I ask for change, and what parts do I have to accept as part of the package? And am I willing to accept those things? Acceptance is a big idea in integrative behavioral couples therapy. Why? Nice. Very nice. So here's what, for those of you watching at home, here's what Y just said about. Y just said, well, <clears throat> isn't it likely that one size does not fit all? Isn't it likely that some couples present with problems that are better suited for a behavioral intervention, some for an emotional intervention, and some for a psychodynamic intervention? And yet, if therapists are trained in one or another of these models, well, then they've got a hammer and every couple is a nail. They're going to use the same hammer on every couple. Shouldn't th the therapy that we give to couples be tailored to the problems of the couple? And the answer, of course, is, well, yes, that's not a bad idea. It's a great, it's a great idea. And a lot, of a lot of therapists, to their credit, do that. A lot of therapists understand all of these models and they might well tailor their therapy. But they're taught the model separately because, and just like I'm teaching them to you, to understand there are different approaches that are sort of coherent among themselves. But indeed, we might draw more or less from different ones of these approaches for different couples, depending on their needs. And you'd hope that a good therapist would indeed do that. So we have these models. And we have therapists using parts of them, some of them, more or less. How can we determine if it works? It's one thing to have a medicine. Like, oh yeah, I've got a lot of medicine. But does it work? Are we actually being, are we able to fix couples? Well, there's a different ways of addressing this question. There's some very specific ways that are quite different from each other of addressing the, the, um, the question of whether therapy actually works, whether it has an effect. One question is, is the therapy better than nothing? Well, so you can imagine the research that addresses this question. You randomly assign couples to either therapy or what's called a waitlist control condition. So what, what happens is this. Therapists, uh, couples come to a clinic and they say, we want therapy. And the person at the clinic says, well, would you be willing to, we'll give you therapy free if you're willing to be a part of a study. So they say, okay, yeah, I'll, be, I'll do it. I'll be part of the study. And now we randomly assign you. Half of you get the therapy right now. Half of you get nothing, and we will we'll, we'll tell you we'll give you therapy in two months, or three months. 
And then at the end of the three months, the couple that, that hasn't gotten anything is measured again, and the couple that got the therapy is measured again, and we compare. Better than nothing means the couple that got the therapy does better than the couple that got nothing, given that they were both drawn from a population that wanted therapy and was suffering. That's one way of addressing these effects. Another is, is it better than other therapies? Much harder. Most research can barely get this done. I say, oh, my therapy is better than no therapy. Better than other therapies would be to say, OK, now I've, got, I've gone to the trouble of training people on one therapy and training people on a whole different therapy and a control condition. Usually, you don't see that very often. So we have a lot more data on this, which I'll tell you about in a moment, than we have on this, whether some therapies are better than others, although we have some data on this too. This is the hardest. Does it work over the long term? So there's two ways to address the therapy, to, to address the effects of therapy. One way would be to say, hi, I've given you 15 weeks of therapy. Week 14, hey, it's week 15. How's it going? You're doing better? Great. See you later. Now that would be an effect, but we don't know if it lasts when the, therapy goes, when the therapist goes away. When they actually leave the office and not come back, we don't know what happens. If we really wanted to know that the therapy worked and fixed the relationship, we'd want to say now, after therapy, once they stopped coming to therapy, they still stayed good. And they stayed good for a long time. That would be a great uh, evidence that the therapy really fixed them and then sent them, on a, on a whole, sent them off on a whole different trajectory. That would be awesome. But very hard to do. Because once you don't have them coming to therapy, couples don't want to talk to you anymore. They move. They leave. Therapists themselves don't follow people who aren't in their practice anymore. So it's very hard to get long-term data on the effects of any of these therapies. And there's one other issue that's so complicated it deserves its own slide. And here it is. There's a distinction between studies that measure effectiveness and studies that measure efficacy. Now, those words are so alike, it's easy to get them confused. But you won't get them confused, will you? And if there's a question on the final a week from Friday that asks you to distinguish between the two, you'll totally get it right, especially you people watching at home. Here's the difference. Effectiveness is about the real world. In the real world, does the intervention produce lasting effects? Does it? When therapists are trained on this and they go out in the world, are they doing good? Are relationships better in the world? That, was, that's, that would be effectiveness. Efficacy is under controlled settings, can the intervention produce a lasting effect? And this is what most research addresses. So if I say I'm going to do a study, I've designed my new therapy, the Carney therapy, the Carney couples therapy, CCT, I'm going to call it, KCT. <laughs> that's, that's silly. OK. So K, KCT is my Carney couples therapy. And if I take it into my lab and I show that couples who get it do better than couples who don't get it, I'm showing efficacy. I'm showing it can be effective. But to actually show effectiveness in the real world, I'd have to then say, OK, and like publish a book and send it out, and then show that in the real world it's really working on real couples. Much harder. This is what most people address, is this efficacy. But a lot of things can get in the way between efficacy and effectiveness. You know, another, another area where there's a big difference between efficacy and effectiveness is in contraception research. And as college students, you probably know that the efficacy of condoms is different from the effectiveness of condoms. And efficacy is always higher, because the efficacy is saying, if I'm controlling everything and everyone, I mean, in a perfect world, is efficacy working? This is saying, but in the real world, does this stuff work? Well, it's the same with therapy as it is with condoms. If everything's going perfect, you tend to get more effects than um, in the real world when things mess up, people don't come to sessions, therapists you know, don't use the intervention perfectly. All of these issues make it very, very hard to assess the effects of a treatment. And treatment outcome research is very hard to do. It's just hard to do. It's hard to do well. Partly it's hard to do well because you're dealing with people who are in pain. To do this research, you've got to do research on people who are in pain. 
And there are a lot of ethical concerns. That said, what do we know? Does couples therapy work? Well, the best data is on for behavioral models and emotion models. It just so happens that those therapists, therapies have been studied best. You know why? Partly because they're what's called manualized. Manualized therapies are therapies that have been um, written about in very, very structured forms so that you can train people, this is how to do the therapy exactly. As opposed to psychodynamic therapy, which is a little bit more loose, where the therapist is given a little bit more discretion. Therapists will, you know, sort of, you know, go with your instincts. Behavioral models and emotional models, there's actually manualized therapy that says, if X, do Y. So you can train a bunch of people to do exactly the same thing, and then you can see, is, is what they're doing having an effect? Traditional behavioral couples therapy is a benchmark intervention because it works reasonably well. What does that mean? What it means is this. In study after study, couples that get traditional behavioral couples therapy generally feel significantly better at the end of the therapy than they did at the beginning, on average. It does improve the relationship significantly. There's a large experimental literature evaluating this model. Partly because it was very, I mean, people thought, this is easy. It doesn't take an, a therapist that's really brilliant, which is good, because there aren't a lot of therapists that are really brilliant. But all it takes is a therapist who knows the rules, and you teach the rules. Anyone can do it. So you can train a bunch of people to do it, and then study how they're doing. Far less is known about psychodynamic models and systems models. I didn't tell you about systems models, but they're in the book. Because it's hard to know, if you get six therapy therapists who are all doing psychodynamic models of therapy, they may actually all be doing quite different things. But six therapists who are doing behavioral models are usually doing the same thing. So we know that traditional behavioral couples therapy does work at least while the therapy is going on. While the therapy is happening, TBCT, traditional behavioral, does have a measurable effect in study after study. I can tell you that for sure. That said, other therapies are probably better. These are just examples. There's just been a few studies. So traditional couples therapy, lots of research. The other therapies, not a lot of research. But some promising studies show that the other therapies do better than the benchmark, better than traditional couples therapy, traditional behavioral. Here's the problem. Inside-oriented marital therapy, look, it does better than traditional couples therapy after four years. So four years later, the people who got the inside-oriented, psychodynamic, were doing better than the people who got the behavioral therapy. Says Snyder, who happens to be an inside-oriented marital therapist. And this is a bit of the problem here, is that the people who show that IBCT, integrative behavioral couples therapy, does just as well as traditional behavioral, and they're happier at the end. Who did that research? Andy Christensen, the founder of Integrative Behavioral Couples Therapy. I'm not saying, I mean, I know Andy. He's a brilliant researcher. He's doing great work. But uh, there is an effect in the literature, which is if you designed your own therapy, your research on that therapy tends to show that it works. Crazy. Emotion-focused couples therapy, same sort of thing. Some research shows that it's more effective than traditional behavioral at the end of therapy. In other words, if you've just gone through 15 weeks of behavioral therapy, and compared to 15 weeks of emotion therapy, people feel better at the end of 15 weeks of emotion therapy compared to 15 weeks of behavioral therapy. David. <clears throat> well, you open up a whole can of worms. I mean, uh, David, here's what David said. David says, I mean, it's sort of off topic, but it's okay. David says, I read a paper which happened to have been written by Andy Christensen, who again, I, he's a brilliant researcher. He did, one he did one study where he showed that non-professional therapists, in other words, couples therapists without a degree of any kind, can do as well and sometimes even better than professional therapists 
when treating couples, which raises an issue, which I don't feel like addressing right now, which is, does training help you be a better therapist? Well, this is such an old issue, David. They have, people ask the same question about teaching. Can you train someone to be a good teacher, or are you just born a good teacher? Well, it's the same question about therapy. Can you train someone to be a good therapist, or are some therapists just in your genes, and if you don't got it, you just don't have it? I don't, uh, I don't know the answer to that. There's a lot of controversy on both sides. But the point is that these other kinds of therapies, insight-oriented, integrative behavioral, emotion-focused, there's at least some evidence that you get either more lasting or deeper change than just straight behavioral therapy, which works, but these may work better. Why? What would be so much better about these? Well, there's a couple things going on. One is all of these other therapies, the sort of more insight-oriented ones, focus on two specific processes, which I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm running out of time, but one of them is called unified detachment. And that process is basically getting people to step away from their problems as a team. You can imagine if I have a problem with my partner that I'm in there and I'm trying to win. You're, it's you against me and we're duking it out. As opposed to saying, hey, it's you and me and there's the problem over there. And you, we're arm in arm facing the problem. That's one way, the one thing that these therapists have in common. And the other thing that these therapies have, have in common is something called empathic joining. Basically the idea of getting people to be closer by helping them to share emotions with each other in a safe way. By letting them be vulnerable to each other and having the experience in the therapy session of that working out well. Now that's sort of something that a lot of therapy has in common here is to say, I'm going to create a safe environment where couples can be vulnerable and it's safe. To guide the couple into having those experiences, hopefully then they can generalize to outside the therapy setting. So these techniques get at deeper issues. Behavioral therapy does not ask about deeper issues. It's, it's quite surface. That doesn't make it bad, but it's not about deeper issues. The behavioral therapy just says, talk different. The therapies that seem to be working a little bit better are therapies that actually do try to get deeper. They work more towards acceptance, as I was talking about, than change. But again, that's a hard process, and it doesn't always work. So, but having said that therapy works generally, here's reasons not to get too excited about the effects of therapy. Here's one. Getting significant improvement, which has been found in study after study after study, that traditional behavioral therapy and the other therapies do get significant improvements. The problem is, that doesn't mean that distressed couples are suddenly happy. Improvement doesn't mean you've gone from unhappy to happy. You can go from really unhappy to just plain old unhappy. And that's a significant improvement, but that's not what we're asking for. That's not what I came to therapy for. I came to therapy because I was once in love. I want to be in love again. Can you give me that? Can you do that for me? I was once not in pain. I want to not be in pain again. I don't, I don't want to just be in a little less pain. I don't want to be bleeding a little less. I want you to staunch the bleeding. Well, only about 40% of distressed couples are not distressed by the end. That means 60% of the couples that are distressed at the beginning are still distressed at the end, even if they've improved. Huh. That's something, but it's not a lot. What's your name? Caleb. This is across therapies. Here's the other problem. Relapse rates are high. Now, we don't know a lot about relapse. Relapse meaning you leave the therapy like, hey, this is great. We fixed it. And then a couple of years later, you're like, oh, no, we didn't fix it at all. There's not a lot of data that follows those couples, I was saying. But the, couple, the data that does follow shows that after people leave therapy, let me imagine, therapy gives you a boost, a boost. Now you're up here. But after a while, you go back to old patterns. In fact, some studies show between 30 and 50% of couples are right back where they started sometime after the therapy ends. Ouch. So even the therapies that succeed in changing couples have trouble making lasting change, have trouble making lasting change. 
And of course, research that has compared effectiveness and efficacy show that even if you can get it in the laboratory, in the real world, some of these, uh, these therapies are a lot less effective when people are sort of doing their own thing and, and not following a rigid manual. Implication is that real distressed couples are mighty hard to change. That's what I want you to take away from this. Couples, uh, the wounds that we give each other and we give our intimate partners heal slowly or not at all. It can be done, but it ain't easy. It's hard. And because it's so incredibly monumentally hard to unbreak the eggshell of intimacy, that some people have argued, let's try something different. Let's try primary prevention instead. We will not be able to unbreak that egg. If you've smashed the egg of intimacy, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Let's cushion the egg instead. Let's strengthen the egg. Let's make sure that the shell never gets broken in the first place. There's a lot to like about this argument. A lot to like about this argument. First of all, early in relationships, motivation might be quite high. Hi, newlyweds. How invested are you in the success of your, of your relationship? Incredibly, success, incredibly motivated. We're so invested. We want this relationship to last forever. Terrific. This is a good time to give you something that you can do to do that. Prevention may be easier than treatment. It may be easier to give people some kind of resources or skills while they're happy that'll keep them happy than it is to actually you know, put Humpty Dumpty back together again and, and unbreak a smashed egg. And also, you can uh, uh, reduce collateral damage. Once people are distressed and in therapy, their kids have suffered, their health has suffered, their blood pressure has suffered, their friends have suffered, their families have suffered. Why don't we, if we can prevent all that suffering by keeping people from becoming distressed, well, that would be a great idea. So the potential then is great for reaching many couples because very few couples go to therapy. Very few couples think they need therapy. But maybe we can tell people, hey, but everybody needs my relationship's vaccine. What if we could develop a divorce vaccine? Well, that'd be pretty good. So that's the argument. And a lot of people are making this argument in the last few years, a lot, saying, look, forget therapy for broken couples. Let's see what we can do for happy couples to keep them happy. And here's generally what's been going on, briefly. There are many forms. So there's premarital counseling. Um, um, Catholic Church requires it. If you're going to get married in a Catholic Church, your church pa pastor, I think, will um, require that you go to some kind of program and have a certificate before you get married, saying you've had a premarital education. There's self-help books, premarital, videotapes, online exercises, workshops, all for couples who are happy. The idea is you're happy, we're going to teach you how to stay happy. We're going to give you the vaccine. But what they're getting varies widely. Some people are getting six hours on a Tuesday night. Some people are getting four weeks of five-hour sessions. Some people are getting a, a weekend retreat. But a, it, the people who are leading the, the way are religious organizations. Makes sense. Because most people do get married in some kind of religious setting. Very few people get married in front of a justice of the peace. A lot of people are getting married in temples and churches. And so temples and churches are invested in saying, hey, newlyweds, um, we want you to stay happy, and we have control over you while you want to have, get married here. So they've been leading the way on getting people sort of some kind of vaccine. The problem is that we, there's very little research on whether these things work. And there's so many different things. But I'll tell you what is also true is consumer satisfaction tends to be very high, which is to say that at the end, if you ask couples who've been through this premarital stuff, did you like it? Did you have a good time? Couples did. And why not? By the way, why? It's very fun. Why? Think of this. You're in love. You're a newlywed. You're a young couple. You're in love. And someone says, hey, do you want to spend six hours talking to each other about why your relationship is so great and how to keep it that way? Well, yeah. <laughs> that sounds pretty fun. But here's the other problem. The who's going to attend this stuff? The couples who think that'll be fun. So imagine two newlyweds. The blissful, their hearts above their heads, they're so excited, perfect newlyweds, and they're about to go to get married. And then someone says, hey, do you want us to also spend a weekend talking about your relationship? Sure, we'd love to. That's a low-risk couple in the first place. 
What about the couple that sort of the, let's just go to Vegas and get this done, sort of the higher risk newlyweds? Well, they're less likely to do any of this. In other words, it's not clear that prevention programs are going to reach the people who might need them most. Well, does it work? Well, I told you, they haven't been tested systematically. When they have been tested, the follow-up periods have been very short. There's some evidence that skills-based programs do improve communication at least. So uh, one program is called, uh, very famous, well-known in the United States, developed by two re researchers at the University of Colorado, Boulder, called PREP, Premarital Relationship Enhancement Program, P-R-E-P, -E PREP. PREP is sort of the Walmart of premarital education, which is to say it's dominant, it is everywhere. And um, PREP is a skills-based program. It's straight behavior. It says, every newlywed, you should learn about using I feel statements. Every newlywed, every newlywed should learn about summarizing what the other person has to say. And there's some evidence that if you give people PREP as newlyweds, they do communicate differently throughout their relationship. But there is some evidence that the effects on the marriage fade. And this makes sense. So in other words, couples that get these interventions, at the end they're like, wow, not only am I happy I got it, but I feel equipped to do everything terrific. Problem is, over time, things change. Life changes. We were talking last week about external forces. Over time in relationships, stuff happens that you didn't expect. So the effects of an intervention you got while you were newlyweds do tend to fade over time. So what about secondary prevention? Here's the argument for secondary prevention, first of all. The question is, should all couples be treated the same? And this is essentially why it's question, anticipating. The problem with programs like PrEP or other kinds of premarital intervention is that they're very costly. They're costly in terms of time and training. Got to train people to do this stuff. And, if, and then we don't know if it works. So there's a lot of resources being devoted to programs that may or may not work. And here's the other problem. Not everyone may need it. It's the same issue uh, with vaccinations nowadays. Nowadays, some families are choosing not to vaccinate their kids. Why? Here's the argument. Why should I give my kid a vaccine against measles when there is no measles practically in the whole country? If smallpox has been practically obliterated, why should I get um, vaccinated against smallpox? Well, this is the same uh, argument has been made about premarital education. If most couples are going to do OK or won't need premarital education, why should I give it to everybody? Maybe I should just give premarital education to the couples that need it. That's secondary prevention. Well, here's a study that addressed this issue. Pretty great study by a guy named Kim Halford and his students. They used a version of PrEP, S-PrEP, which means self-administered PrEP. It's basically you're reading the rules. No one's telling you them, but you're just teaching yourself what you're supposed to do. And they gave it to high and low risk couples. Here's how they defined high and low risk. High risk, if your parents divorced or if your father was aggressive. So if you report that your parents broke up or, and or, you report that your dad was physically aggressive towards your mom, that was called a high risk person. Low risk was your parents were intact and no aggression. Everyone got the premarital intervention, and they looked at change over four years. Let me show you what they found. This is another one of Tom's slides. Look, what they found was this. The low risk folks do better in the control group. The low risk folks the people who didn't have a risk, didn't have a history, they did better without the intervention. The high-risk folks were helped by the intervention. So the low-risk women and the low-risk men did better in the control condition than the treatment condition. But the high-risk men and the high-risk women, high-risk women and high-risk men, did better in the treatment condition than in the control condition. So what's the story say? What's this, what's this study say to us? The study says, look, how you get this vaccine, this self-prep or premarital enhancement vaccine, depends on your risk. When risk is high, the intervention is great. 
People who are at risk need protection. And any kind of protection might help them. We might think of better or worse protection, but some kind of protection seems to work. But when risk is low, if you're not at risk for smallpox or divorce, you may not need a vaccine or a premarital intervention. In fact, it may harm you. If it's not broken, don't fix it. And so, secondary prevention is probably more viable than primary prevention. Nowadays, the smart money is saying, we need to find people at risk, and those are the people we give interventions to. But how do we know who's at risk? Relationship research. Class dismissed.